Let's talk about regression. So whether you're in AP Statistics in high school or taking an intro-level stack course in college, you're probably going to be learning about regression. Now I personally love regression. I find it really easy to follow and intuitive, but not everyone feels that way. It can definitely get really complicated with all the different variables and interpretations, but I'm hoping I can clear up some of the confusion by the end of this video. Hi, my name is Rachel. I'm a statistics major at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and I'm really passionate about learning about statistics and data science, as well as teaching fundamental concepts. And you can find more of those videos on my YouTube channel, as well as other lifestyle videos about my experience. Okay, so what is regression? Well, regression is gonna be the measure of a relationship between an X variable and a Y variable. Suppose we were trying to measure the height of a plant in inches when it was given a certain amount of water. We would take our data from the study and we would plot it on a scatter plot. And then we would find a line in the middle of all that data in order to best represent it. Now this line is gonna be used to predict the value of Y. Now this line is known as Y hat. The hat means that it's a predictive variable. Now where do we see regression used in the real world? Well, regression is used in simple studies like I mentioned before, in stocks, finance, marketing, data analytics, machine learning, and a whole bunch more. Okay, now that we know what regression is and where it's used, let's see how we can use it. So we first need to find a line in the middle of all those data points, and it's a little bit more complicated than just taking a ruler and eyeballing it. Your computer software is gonna generate thousands of lines in order to represent the data, but only one of those lines is gonna represent it the best, hence why it's called the line of best fit. Now the line of best fit can be calculated different ways, but in regression, we use the least squares residual line. Wait, what's a residual? A residual is gonna be the difference between your observed value and your predicted value. So let's say we're trying to predict the height of a plant when it was given five cups of water. So we can see that based on our data, our observed height of the plant when it was given five cups of water was 7.5 inches. But based on our line of best fit, the predicted value was six inches. So we would take the observed value, 7.5, and subtract off the predicted value, six. And then we end up with a residual of 1.5. And in statistical terms, a residual is noted as E. So the residual for five cups of water is going to be 1.5. So the least square residual line is gonna calculate the residual for every single data point to the regression line. It's gonna square the residuals and then sum it up. Now the reason we square the residuals is because the data points above the regression line are gonna have a positive residual and the data points below it are gonna have a negative residual. So by squaring it, we get rid of the negative sign. Then we're gonna sum up all the squared residuals and eventually your computer program is gonna find a regression line with the smallest sum of squared residuals. And that's why it's called a least square regression line because we're looking at the smallest sum of squared residuals. Now this line can be known as Y hat, line of best fit, the least square regression line or regression line. So don't get too confused about the wording. So most of the time your computer software or your teacher is gonna give you the line of best fit or your regression line, but sometimes you're gonna to have to calculate it yourself. But don't worry, it's not that hard. So the whole point of statistics is that we're using a sample in order to make inferences about the population. We're not always, almost never gonna be given information about the population as it's really hard to get every single piece of data. So in this case, we're taking our sample from our study of the plant height and we're gonna predict the total plant height among the population. So our population regression line is gonna be E of Y plus beta one X plus beta one plus epsilon. And this epsilon is gonna be the population residual, but we don't know what any of these population terms really are because again, we don't have data about the population. So we're gonna use a sample regression line in order to predict it. So our sample regression line is gonna be Y hat is equal to B one X plus B naught plus lowercase e i. And this lowercase e i is gonna be a residual. And we don't really see this last term, the lowercase e i, a residual in our sample regression line because our residual is gonna be different for each and every value of x. So all these terms in our sample regression line ultimately predict the values in our population regression line. And you can see here that b1 and beta1 are the slope and b0 and beta0 are the intercept. And you may see the position of B1X and B0 switched, but just know that B1 is a slope term that goes in front of X. So the way I like to remember if something is about the population or the sample is that if it has capital Greek letters. So you can see here that in the population regression line, we have betas, which are capital Greek letters. So that kind of tells me in my head that it's a population regression line. Now we have to calculate these coefficients. So in order to calculate B1, we're gonna do R times S of Y over S of X, where S of Y is gonna be your standard deviation of Y, S of X is going to be your standard deviation of X, and R is going to be the square root of your correlation coefficient, or the coefficient of determination. 
So now we're going to take these numbers that have been given to us already and we're going to plug it in and we end up with a number of 0 0.475. Now in order to calculate B0, we're going to do Y bar minus B1 times X bar. Y bar is going to be the average of all the Y values and X bar is going to be the average of all the X values. So we plug in all the respective numbers and we end up with 4.368. So now we have all the numbers. Let's plug it into our regression line. We have y hat is equal to 4.36 plus 0.475x, where x is going to be the amount of water and y hat is going to be the predicted height of the plant in inches. And notice because our scatter plot has a positive slope, we can see that our b1 value is positive. Now let's interpret these values. Let's interpret the intercept, which is b0. 4.36. So what's an intercept in mathematical terms? See if you can remember. Well, an intercept is going to be the value of y wherever x is equal to zero. So in context of this problem, whenever the amount of water is equal to zero, the predicted average height of a plant in inches is going to be 4.36. Now let's interpret the slope. So what is slope in mathematical terms? Well, slope is going to be rise over run, the amount of y units over x units. So if we do some simple algebra in our head, we can see that 0.475 is going to be the y units over 1 is going to be the x units. So that means it's going to rise 0.475 and go to the right 1 unit. So for every 1 unit increase in the amount of water, the predicted height of the plant in inches increases by 0.475 on average. So remember, on average is really important. This is only a prediction, an approximation of the y values, so we need to remember to use on average. So now we have our model, but how do we know if it's a good regression model, and why do we care if it's a good regression model? Now beyond statistics, think of a business model, or a product or service. If it's a bad model, then there's no point in using it, unless you're going to fix it. I'm going to look at R squared, SE, and eventually end up doing a hypothesis test. So R squared and SE should only really be visual inspectors here. They shouldn't be the end-all be-all. Your hypothesis test is ultimately what tells you if your model is significant or not. So we can see here that our R squared is 0.26. Now overall, we want an R squared that's pretty high, anything above 0.7. But again, it's all relative because the R squared tells you the percent of variability that's due to the model. So to interpret this, we could say that 26% of the variability in the predicted Y values or plant height is due to the regression model. If you wanna know more about the derivation of R squared and SST, SSR, and SSE, There'll be a video linked to that in the description below. So let's look at SE. Now SE is going to be the standard deviation of residuals, also known as root mean square error. So SE, we want it to be small because we want our variation of residuals to be small. The more spread out our residuals are, the worse, because we want data that's more close together as it ends up leading to a better approximation of the data. So our SE here is 2.36. That's a relatively small number, but again, these are numbers that are kind of ambiguous, so it's hard to say anything. Overall, we want a high R squared and a low SE, but for this model, we have a low R squared and a low SE. So let's do a hypothesis test. So for a hypothesis test, you can do a right tail test, a left tail test, or a two-sided test. So a right tail test is going to be used when you're looking for a positive correlation between your data, when you're doing regression. Where a left tail test is you're looking for a negative correlation. But today, I'm going to do a two-sided test, and a two-sided test accounts for both the left tail and the right tail. Now, the reason we say two-tail or left tail is because for like a right tail test, you're looking at the right side of the t-distribution, the right tail, for a positive correlation, whereas a left tail, you're looking at the left side, the left tail. And then a two-tail test is looking at both the left side and the right side. So for our hypothesis, we're going to have our null hypothesis be beta 1 is equal to 0. An alternative is going to be beta 1 is not equal to 0. And we're using beta 1 because this is the slope, the slope of the population. We're going to be using our sample statistics in order to make a prediction about the population parameter. So even though we have the population parameter in our hypothesis, we're ultimately going to be using data from our sample. And we're using the coefficient for the slope here because that is ultimately what tells us if our model is good or not. The intercept doesn't really tell us much, but if your slope is the horizontal line, which is zero, then that means your model isn't changing, even if x is increasing. But if your model slope is significantly not equal to zero, then there's a significant change in your model, which is good. We want that. So we're going to calculate our test statistic. Now you can use a t-test or an f-test here. They will ultimately tell you the same information. I'm going to use a t-test. So for our test statistic, it's going to be b1 minus beta1 over the standard error of b1. Now you can get those numbers from your ANOVA table, and we're going to plug it in, and we're going to end up with a number of 3.68. Now, what does this number tell us? Well, honestly, it's a really ambiguous number. It doesn't really tell you much, unless you have a p-value. 
So you can either calculate your p-value using a t-table or some computer software. You'll end up getting the same number. Now what does a p-value tell us? Well, let's look at a t-distribution. So if you draw this little shape on your paper and you mark 3.68 to the right, positive number, and negative 3.68 to the left, just kind of eyeball it. Now if you color the area under the curve to the right and left of those points, that will be your p-value once it's added up. So the reason we have the right side and the left side is because remember this is a two-sided test. We're going to take both the left side and the right side. So when we add it up, we end up with a p-value of 0 0.0007. There should be three zeros after the decimal point. So now what does the p-value tell us? Well, I have a whole video on that that will be uploaded soon, but in general, the p-value tells us how much evidence we have for the null hypothesis. So we want a really small p-value because the smaller our p-value, the more likely we are to reject our null hypothesis. So then how do we know how small we want our p-value? Well, that's where the significance level comes in. So if the p-value is less than the significance level, then we reject the null hypothesis. Now your default significance level is going to be 0 0.05, unless your teacher tells you differently. So then we take our p-value, 0, 0, 0007, which is less than our significance level of 0 0.05. So we can reject the null hypothesis. Now we reject the null hypothesis, but what does it really mean? Well, this means that we had little evidence to support the claim that the null hypothesis was saying. If our p-value was bigger, we would fail to reject. Now, just like you say, not guilty instead of innocent in court, we're always looking for the evidence against the null hypothesis, which is why we say reject or fail to reject. We can never really accept the null hypothesis or say that it's true. So by rejecting the null hypothesis, we can say that our slope was a significant linear predictor of y. If we had failed to reject the null hypothesis, there wouldn't be enough evidence to say that our slope is a linear predictor of y. Now notice here how I'm putting the conclusion in terms of the alternative. So though I am rejecting the null hypothesis, I am saying we have evidence for the alternative hypothesis. But if we were to say fail to reject the null hypothesis, we would say there is not enough evidence for the alternative. So knowing our slope is significant, we know that our model is a good model and that our regression model can almost accurately predict the value of y. So let's do a prediction itself. So we would have our regression equation, which is from earlier, 4.36 plus 0.475x, where x we would plug in our value of how much water we want. So let's say we're trying to predict the height of a plant if it was given seven cups of water. So we would plug in seven into where x is, and we would do some simple algebra, and we end up with a number of 7.68. Now, what does this 7.68 tell us? Well, this tells us that the predicted average height of a plant in inches when it's given seven cups of water is 7.68. So that pretty much ends it for this video. I purposely left out things like the assumptions and SST, SPE, because I wanted to make full videos on those that go more into depth. So this will be linked in the description below once those are uploaded. If you think I made any mistakes, please leave a comment down below. Hopefully I caught everything and either put them in the description below or fix it in the edit. But this is my first video, so mistakes are bound to happen and I'm hoping to improve as I go on. And I would love to hear feedback from you guys, whether it's your comments about this video, new videos that you would like to see, or just anything in general. Make sure to subscribe and like this video and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!